song at London Iron Night. We here at MSTW know that the cultural institution of hip-hop is inseparable from the teachings of the black American civil rights movement. With that said, per the instruction of leaders such as Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Kwame Ture, and many others, it is our job as white people to confront and dismantle the white Christian neoliberalism we were all raised under. This is what Middleside Topwise stands for. I say this because the criticism we received from our last video, Eminem is not an ally, amounted to many people completely ignoring all the points we made to instead chastise us with white liberal concessions like, he's doing a lot more than other entertainers, and has grown a lot since the 90s. We also had some folks suggest that we have no business speaking for black people, which to this day, we have not done. All right, so let me make this clear. As someone who grew up with many people who were emboldened to pop pills, throw around the F slur, and say fuck the world to his music, uh, Eminem is not an ally to poor white people. Marshall Mathers and the many corporate interests behind him exploit poor white people for profit. He has done far worse for white Americans than he has done good for black Americans. This was confirmed for me when a commenter brought up M's 2015 letter to Tupac's mother, Afeni Shakur. In it, he offers many examples of how he does not have a fucking clue as to what hip-hop is actually about. Tupac Shakur was a second-generation member of the Black Panther Party, and for all intents and purposes, the leader of the civil rights movement in the 1990s. His music was accessible to many, but was made specifically for the black community as a rallying cry against white supremacy. Pac literally could not have been more upfront about this. White people, like myself, cannot identify with the circumstances that created hip-hop culture. What we can do is represent and spread the values of the higher infinite power helping oppressed people in a thoughtful and respectful way. I refer you to Kenny Beats, Third Base, and Snow. Yes, Snow. The white Canadian one-hit wonder who adopted a Jamaican patois has shown more actual respect to the black community than Eminem ever has. I made a whole video about it. Dude's a G. Eminem cherry-picked the most shallow and regressive aspects of Tupac's music and public personality, which were intentionally developed as an act to show the world how pissed off black people are about their continued oppression for his own personal gain. The white lens that Marshall Mathers sees the world through allows him to ignore race when he feels like it, the exact same way people are appropriating Dear Mama today. Tupac Shakur did not promote individualism or aggression towards members of his own community. He was a conscious hip-hop artist that was making a mockery of racist media stereotypes. Fuck the world refers to the systems that oppress black people, not cancel culture and the haters. On Mortal Man, we find a true disciple of the late rapper desperately reaching out beyond the grave for guidance. Pop. 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 Reciting a poem that beautifully elucidates the meaning of the phrase, to pimp a butterfly, the Compton MC remembers that this can only be a one-way conversation. Sometimes I can like get behind a mic and I don't know what type of energy I'm gonna push out. K-Dot is so emotionally invested in the music that his own creative energy overwhelms him. Truly an unparalleled level of vulnerability on this song. Because the spirits, we ain't even really rapping. We just letting our dead homies tell stories for us. Damn. Tupac's simple yet profound response is that the ancestors are speaking through him. What ancestors do you think a guy named Marshall Mathers III is tapping into? If you'd like to hear a great hip-hop song about the unique struggles of our poor white ancestors in America, go check out Brother Ali's Before They Called You White. Anyway, while poor white Europeans were being indoctrinated into white supremacy with promises of free land and labor, people like Nat Turner were at their wit's end with American hypocrisy. In 1831, he led a violent slave rebellion that is said to have left over 50 dead by his hand alone. That's gonna be like, like Nat Turner, 1831. As Pac predicts that a similar energy will return in the modern era, Lamar takes a more passive approach. The only hope that we kind of have left is music. This is the exact same conversation that was happening between activists and accomplices in the 1960s. In a sense, both perspectives have value, and both are missing something. 
Stoking people to senseless violence will only lead to increased aggression from trigger-happy state officials. On the other hand, inspiring the people with powerful songs of peace and love, or even deep political conviction, is not stopping corporations from destroying the earth and humanity with that same state-sponsored violence. Once you turn 30, it's like they take the heart and soul out of a man, out of a black man. Now, these are all concepts that I think we can all identify with to some degree as workers, but I can tell you for a fact that 100% of my ancestors decided to come to America and change their name to something more white-sounding so they could get in on the spoils of late-stage colonialism. Where factory work has long been a point of pride amongst the white working class, chattel slavery, and the remnants of it that we still see today, has, for good reason, never held that level of honor amongst black workers. There may be overlaps in experience, but your struggles as a white person are just not comparable to that of any black person. Stop it. In this country, a black man only have like five years we can exhibit maximum strength. Much like the civil rights leaders of the 1960s, Tupac sees the power of the youth as a mobilizing force for change. We're not talking about economics tonight. We are talking about the survival of a race of people. That is all that is at stake. The window of opportunity is narrow, hence the deliberate use of popular music as a means to subtly spread political ideology. The revolution did not sell out. Resistance, I, it's been met with resistance. And not only me, but it goes down my family tree. In May 1971, Afeni Shakur and 20 other members of the Black Panther Party were acquitted on 156 charges of conspiracy and terrorism against the New York Police Department. Shakur, while six months pregnant with her son, would defend herself in court and get undercover cop Ralph White to confess that he orchestrated all illegal activities. Not only that, he admitted that the activism he witnessed while working with the Panthers was powerful, inspiring, and beautiful. Afeni would give birth to Lassane Parish Crooks on June 16th, 1971, just one month later. It was happening to me for a reason, you know what I'm saying? I was noticing shit. I was, I was punching the right buttons and it was happening. This is like the most casual conversation about chaos magic I've ever heard. Kendrick knows what's up. The answer to Metatron, Nick Gabriel. In this inspired passage, we hear the same sentiment MSTW has repeated time and time again. Just like in any industry, musicians are skilled workers who are being aggressively exploited by major corporations. The reason I bring this up is because at the time, CD sales were providing what seemed like an endless stream of cash to record labels. And for better or worse, many artists saw this as an opportunity to create some real equity for the black community. But then the internet came in and decided that the better solution is to make everything free. Hello. Ground is a symbol for the poor people. Right. The poor people is going to open up this whole world and swallow up the rich people. Tupac Shakur has always espoused a collectivist ideology that had nothing to do with record sales, battle rap, or territorial pissing. The man was making deeply class-conscious art that was palatable to the masses. And that's what made him dangerous. In part seven of our series, What Rage Against the Machine Was Talking About, we discuss Mumia Abu-Jamal's participation in the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention of 1970, which Afeni Shakur also attended. Despite the unifying measures taken during these few days in early September, the event is often said to have created the split between Huey Newton's West Coast and Eldridge Cleaver's East Coast factions. By the late 1980s, Huey Newton had been murdered and Eldridge Cleaver had converted to Christian conservatism. Yeah. With the Black Panther Party disintegrating, the children of these great leaders would attempt to put the pieces back together, and we begin to see artists like Public Enemy, Ice Cube, and KRS-One revive the revolutionary mindset of their forefathers. Tupac was no different. Kendrick Lamar knows he carries that torch, and it weighs on him heavily. With snippets found throughout the record, we now get the full written piece that would inspire To Pimp a Butterfly, relaying his transformational visit to South Africa to the homies on the block. Oklahoma humbly considers his place in the black revolutionary pantheon. Ghost of Mandela, hold my flow, stay Nelson Mandela was the South African Marxist revolutionary who spent 27 years in prison for planning 221 acts of government sabotage with his Mkoto We Sizwe, or Spear of the Nation, guerrilla army. Released in 1990, 
he quickly became the first democratically elected president of South Africa, but would retire from politics after installing a new constitution just a few years later. When shit hit the fan, is you still a fan? Throughout the song, Kendrick seamlessly intertwines friendship, fandom, and followers, questioning whether his impact is real or just another disposable product of the media cycle. How many leaders you said you needed, then left them for dead? Here, we get a list of individuals who, at one point, were deemed saviors within the black community, only to be eliminated for their philanthropic efforts. Except for JFK, I don't know why he's in there. Fuck that guy. Is it Moses? Moses was turned on by his followers after leading them to salvation. Sissy Huey Newton or Detroit Red? Huey Newton and Detroit Red, or Malcolm X, were both assassinated by members of rival black revolutionary organizations. Is it Jackie? Is it Jesse Owens? Jackie Robinson and Jesse Owens both uneventfully bowed out of sports and died relatively young, dealing with significant financial and personal issues throughout their lives. I know it's Michael Jackson, oh! Okay, so here's the thing about Michael Jackson. If people knew that he was doing what he was accused of doing, then that means there are dozens, if not hundreds, of parents that are very much alive today who openly and willingly delivered their kids to him for money. Either that, or two washed-up dancers are lying for money. Okay, moving on. Generation X, will I ever be your ex? Born on June 17th, 1987, Kendrick Lamar Duckworth is a member of the millennial generation. As someone born just a few years earlier, I can tell you from experience that the Gen X hip-hop purist is the guy that will come to your concert, get right up to the front of the stage real early, and proceed to sit there with arms crossed, mean mugging the talent and pretty much anybody who touches them for the entire performance. Don't even get them started on skinny jeans. So I can find clarity, like how much you cherish me. K-Dot talks to his fans as he does a lover, or the Godhead itself. The trials and tribulations of this affair leading him through a powerful journey of discovery and awakening. I got abandonment issues, that's not Nelson like. Want you to love me like Nelson? Continuing to pour his heart out to the listener, the TDE alum expresses his fears like few rappers have ever dared to do on record. Evoking images of the prison cell where Mandela did much of his time, Kendrick contemplates the sacrifices that come with real change. You wanna walk in his shoes, but your peacemaker seldom. Here, Lamar openly recognizes his fallibility, stating that his intentions do not always line up with his actions. A passionate and tortured soul, he aspires to be more like the man who, in the name of peace and goodwill, forgave those who brutalized him and his people for decades. The second verse is mostly a series of rhetorical questions that are as relevant to your local hustler as they are to the most dedicated of political activists. 25 years, about the time Mandela was in prison, is a common life sentence in America. The parallels of seemingly ignorant street life and conscious revolutionary action are myriad and are treated no differently by the establishment. I freed you for being a slave in your mind, you're very welcome. When he asks for loyalty, it's not out of your usual petty narcissism or desire for attention. He's genuinely asking if the listener is as invested in the music and the revolution of consciousness that is intended to spring forth from it as he is. It's your smile on permanent, it's your foul on lifetime. The fight for black American liberation in the 1960s was greatly assisted by the unbridled energy of the white anti-war movement. After communism thoroughly kicked the shit out of America in the Vietnam War and desegregation was passed, many of these white college students lost interest in societal change and organizations like the Community Reform Interparty Service fell victim to every type of sabotage imaginable via Nixon's COINTELPRO campaigns. One of the reasons that black people aren't really getting what they want or what they need from this society is simply because we haven't established any economic base. Because and then we, and then, and then, that's right, but yet and still, you still got to get out there somewhere and you're not going to get an economic base from studying black. Yeah, I want to know black myself. But first, I also realize that that economic situation is not going to get me out there. You. How do you form an economic base in a racist society form. when you are the minority? How did they form it? By the gun. Mortal Man is the last song on Kendrick Lamar's To Pimp a Butterfly, his second release dedicated to the late Tupac Shakur. After this epic roller coaster ride of an album, I feel like his 2017 follow up, Damn, is an ironic retort to the feedback he received from it trading out the experimental jazz funk fusion and spoken word elements for more radio-friendly bangers and brag raps. 2022's The Heart Part 5 returns to these feelings of inadequacy and distrust over Marvin Gaye's 1976 hit, I Want You, a phrase he repeats multiple times on Mortal Man. He desperately wants the hood to love him like Nelson, to love him like Tupac, 
not out of some personal savior complex, but a heartfelt demand for the change those types of personalities manifest in the world. Like so many before him, Kendrick Lamar is navigating his own perilous human existence, while attempting to push the envelope of the culture that is the current embodiment of the civil rights movement. Like he says himself, it might be all there is left. Good night and good luck.